Hi, I'm Jeff Yarger. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics at Arizona State University. I'm Samrat Amin. I'm a operations director for the CEC core at Arizona State University. We're making this video today to introduce uh, TA Instruments DSC 2500, Discovery 2500, and what you would do to generally set up an experiment, um, run the experiment, and be able to collect the data. We'll make future videos on how to analyze this data and do uh, advanced processing and thermodynamic uh, analysis of it. But today, what we really want to focus on is we have a new DSC 2500. It does, you know, uh, it has an auto sampler on it so that you can set up numerous samples um, to be able to, to get the data. And we we'll really want to just focus on after assuming you have made your sample and you put it into the DSC, so you put it into the auto sampler, we're going to focus on, you know, interfacing with the computer to be able to get that sample, put it into the DSC, collect the data needed, the calorimetric data. So if we uh, go to the instrument directly or run it remotely, which is what we're doing, you know, so just pulling back the computer screen to a remote point where you can run it like you're sitting at the instrument directly. In fact, exactly. all interactions with the instrument is done through the, a computer interface, nothing uh, outside of putting the sample into the auto sampler tray is done, you know, anything directly on the instrument. So right. whether you sit at the instrument, you know, in front of you with the computer or run it remotely, you're really doing the same thing. It's very um, convenient. Yeah, so we're uh, sitting outside of where the DSC is, but this is exactly the computer, the window screen we would see if um, the DSC was not run, but the computer was booted into the general account that anyone can collect data on, right? Yep. And the software used to both collect the data and analyze it is Trios, mm -hmm. which is uh, a software designed, uh, it w runs only on Windows, right? Yeah, I, I think I'm that's pretty right. sure it runs only on Windows, and I think it runs, you know, on any modern Windows as well as even some of the legacy. Yeah. But uh, it's, you know, the nice thing about this is it's freely downloadable mm -hmm. from um, TA Instruments. So, um, you know, anyone, after you have the data, you can download Trios on any Windows machine. And even if you're running a, a Mac, you can run some Windows emulator, some right. Fusion or VMware, or, right. um, Parallels, Parallels is kind of, if you're running Linux, you can run some, I assume it'll probably run well under like a wine, you know, a, a sure. Windows yeah. emulator of some sort. Yeah. Um, so, so you have options no matter almost what system you're on, you should be able to download Trios mm -hmm. either and, and be able to run it. So if we, um, most of the time when you're, when people are running it after they collect the data, it's just for analysis. We're going right. to use it today for if you're trying to collect data. Right. So if we start running Trios on the computer, we have, you could do it from the start, but we have a, a basically a shortcut, right, yeah. uh, on the desktop. And the nice thing here, and, and this is, uh, is if you had multiple instruments, they would mm -hmm. all show up here. So the yeah. same piece of software can run any of the thermodynamic suite of calorimeters, or even I want to say their mechanical testers. Yeah, and, it goes beyond uh, yeah. just their Almost any of their instruments can be run. We only right. have one instrument hooked up to it, and it is the DSC 2500. And it even kind of shows a picture of, of what it looks like. Oh, right. Perfect. So yeah, we just hit connect, and it'll take a few seconds to and it, it even tells you that it's a you know a DSC. Now I don't the MMRC is where it's located in the magnetic resonance research, and I don't know what the 50, uh, 50 is. I assume it's a connection number of yeah. some sort. So this is now bringing it up where oftentimes it'll bring it up. A half the time you would say this is what you what it looks like when you walk into the DSC because it's right. since this computer is basically dedicated computer to running this calorimeter, oftentimes the calorimeter software is already up and running. But if not, right. you can get it up and running. And oftentimes this is completely blank, like nothing has been run. Everything's yeah. been kind of stored and reset, like they were going to give it over to a new user. But oftentimes there'll be something in the run queue. Right. Um, there might even be things running. But yeah. keep in mind, you can set up experiments if the, you know, by putting them into the auto sampler slot and creating a design and adding it to the queue even if something is running on the instrument. 
So we're gonna show it kind of from scratch, but keep in mind, even if there is experiments running through the queue currently and something already in the experimental design, you can, you know, those have been saved into the queue and you can add your experiment at any time. Exactly. So what we wanna do is kind of from scratch show that we've sealed a sample of indium we put it into sample, um, the auto sampler uh, position number three mm -hmm. um, in the thing. It weighs, you know, five milligram. We, we have the weight of both the sample uh, and the total weight of the sample and the container or, or, you know, the pan it's in. And so just with that information, we hermetic, this was a hermetically sealed sample. Uh, we put it in there. Now, once you have your samples in the auto sampler, you can run them from there, but you can, pull it up anywhere and set up any type of experiment. And as long as it's still in the auto sampler, if you decide later, oh, I wanna run a different experiment at a different rate or some other type of calorimetry ramp rate or, or change or isothermal, et cetera, you can come back and as long as it's still in the auto sampler, you know, set that up from anywhere and run this, right? That's right. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna set up what you would say is almost the first experiment on the most common sample. Right. NDM is the most commonly used standard for differential scanning calorimetry. Mm -hmm. um, and why is that? Um, I think of it as because it's in a somewhat accessible temperature range. Like, right. you know, it's in the, you know, between 100 and 200 Celsius, which mm -hmm. everyone kind of thinks of as kind of, you know, uh, maybe a little high for biological sure. systems. But, you know, uh, you need a metal, having it be a metal that doesn't, you know, oxidize very easily or change is, is important in a standard. And, and by it being a, a metal, it means it, it won't have much of a vapor pressure or any type of change. So it, it just has a lot of characterization that, uh, characteristics that make it really good for using the melting point as a, a standardization, right. one that lasts for a long time. Metals exactly. are very good, you know, thermal conductors, yep. conductors of heat, which make a big difference, et cetera. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, so we've taken a small sample of it. I mean, five milligrams is just like, you know. Just a speck. Yeah, basically. the speck on, on the end of your <laughs> spatula that you put in there. I think we usually use a little wire and just cut yeah. kind of the smallest little piece of indium wire and put it in this thing. We hermetically seal it, which is a fancy way of praying, saying pressure seal it. And do you know these hermetic pans used by D, uh, their total volume is about what? Like, um, what is, is it? Couple hundred microliters, microliters? Yeah, yeah, roughly. Yeah, that's what I would have guessed too. So, um, and hermetic seal is a fancy way of, in a sense, saying pressure seal. But I think of it as how, you know, it it, it, it allows it to, ex, you know, before it will break that seal, you can have an internal pressure of several atmospheres. Yeah. So from right. what I understand, it's three or four. Yeah, that sounds about right. Before it, it'll it'll in a sense break its seal. But you can almost mm -hmm. always tell if the internal pressure is expanded because it almost bulges bulges yeah, the pan right. and stuff which actually has repercussions of bulging its contact etc right, right yeah it can affect your experiment okay so we have that sample in there and we even have a way that you can watch the auto sampler in the system we're not going right. to show that today we have that in a different video but mm -hmm. you can log in because there's a um uh a cloud-based camera right. there. I think we use Nest, but it doesn't really matter. There's a million of them that you can watch the auto sampler, um, grab the reference and the sample, sample pans and yeah. put it in. And there's a practical reason for that, which is, you know, one of the failure things is how do you know that the auto sampler actually got the samples into, <laughs> you know, the DSC correctly? I mean, it, the mechanism for the auto sampler could drop, but et cetera. And it does. Every yeah. now and then. But I mean, it's yeah. that said, it's fairly reliable, right? right. Like yeah. it drops maybe one out of a hundred. We've or? run hundreds so far, and it's only done that once. Yeah, so. I've run, you know, uh, about a thousand or so, <laughs> and and I just had one problem yeah. myself. So it, it's, it's rare, robust. but but it's nice to be able to visually verify that, yeah, exactly. that the sample made it in there and, and right. you don't run into anything. Well, and it, it even tracks it with a laser, so it knows most of the time when it drops a pan. So it'll just freeze, not do anything else. Uh, so so yeah. even if you didn't see it visually, you'd almost know. Yeah, exactly. So so it's, um, 
sitting there uh, with, with a whole bunch of samples in the auto sampler. Right. Uh, we put one in position number three and now we're gonna run it. So yeah. what's the first step of that is to design the experiment we wanna run. Right. And so that's knowing something about indium and we do know. We know that it, you know, it has a melting temperature of 156 degrees Celsius and, right. and we know it's enthalpy of fusion. Or, um, so by knowing that though, we can uh, kind of say like, let's run, you know, let's run basically 150, or no, 20 degrees below melting. So right. we'll say, um, you know, somewhere in the 130, and then let's go right. about 20 degrees above. So yeah. let's go up to 170, 180. Sure. Um, and let's ramp it, I don't want to go too slow, but let's, you know, do about 10 degrees per minute. Okay. And then that's the data I want to collect is just that, in a sense, the melting of solid indium, yeah. where I have some baseline that gives me the heat capacity a little above while it's still in the solid state and a little... After. Uh, yeah, yeah, a little before and a little after. Right? Sure. So um, the first thing you would do to set up an experiment on this software is you go down to the experiments tab, which we're already in. Um, typically, when you load the software, you might be in the results page here with a bunch of uh, yeah, results and it, and you can have a whole series of results yeah. and and even look at those while your other experiments yeah. are running. So. Yeah, and going back to what we were talking about, this Trio software, this software actually running all these different instruments, it's made to overlay data from multiple instruments, even right. So if you have, you know, a TGA and a DSC, you can actually take uh, both thermograms and overlay them on the same. So there's some conveniences here. But uh, to set up an experiment, we'd go down to the experiments tab here and um, we just create a new run here to start with. So immediately um, it comes into this view here where it gives you some information about your sample. And then you come over onto this panel here and you just start filling out a few bits of information here. So I'm just gonna put in the sample name Indium, and then I usually like to give it some kind of other description, but for now we'll just leave it out. Um, and then um, you put in the parameters for where your sample is, what sample mass, and the pan mass, the empty pan mass. Yeah, and so we're at sample so, number three. three. Uh, the sample mass is 5.08 milligrams, and then the pan weighs 53.44, so the aluminum pan and lid that we use to hermetically seal is, is that way. And like you said, and this is going to be used as the file name as well. Exactly. Right, right so here, whatever the, you So what here. you started to do is, is pretty relevant. Like I like, like you said, you can use spaces, but mm -hmm. I like to use underscores because there's certain file systems right. that make uh, spaces space a pain. Friendly. Right. Um, but, but you're right, instead of spaces, my, my trick is the same. I always use underscores. And, and I think making sample names that are fairly descriptive is always useful. Yeah. You know? Not just giving it a sample number that then you have to... Right. Well, think. and these parameters are actually saved into the file. So it's not that you can't go back and pull those numbers up later. But when right. it's actually in the file name, you can just pull up... You can say, just look at your file oh, list and say... that one that was three milligrams. It's yeah. this one, right? Yeah. So. Um, it's always a good practice. So, operator, do you usually just use, uh, you know, yeah. you can put your full name or do you just I put I use my initials yeah, usually. But you could do so, probably either. Yeah. And then, in a sense, all of this information right here, the operator um, project and notes, like, all I can encourage is, you know, especially under notes, the more information that all gets put into the header mm -hmm. uh, of the file, right? Yeah. So, both when you save it as ASCII, right. um, and you know, in the binary, binary that it does. So file. the more you give it here, uh, the you know, yep. the better. Because half the time, that's the problem: is you go to look at old data and you don't remember some details about the sample. So there's really nothing, you know, being able to put that this, you know, where did the indium come from? That it came from a wire. What what purity of the indium was? What the lot number? What right. you know, the purity? You know, where. Uh, the company you got it from, you know, anything, the way I always think about these things is you want to be able to reproduce experiments. <laughs> and, and to be able to exactly reproduce experiment, you need to know a lot of the devils in the details. You need to know a lot of details 
of where you got that sample from. If something looks a little different, is it because the indium was a little different? Is it because the DSC right. was a little different? <laughs> you know, et cetera. Like, the more information you give here, the better off you are. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the one main thing we forgot here was to talk about the reference pan also. So um, this DSC, you can configure it um, to use multiple reference pans. And typically, you want to match up a reference pan with whatever type of pan that you're using, right? So in this case, like you said, we're using a hermetically sealed aluminum pan. And um, when I pull the drop down here, you can tell that it has a bunch of reference numbers where it expects reference pans to be. So all of these positions have some kind of empty pan in there. Well, and, and the if user... you want to find out what those are, right, you can go to another menu that show you yeah. each of those. In right? the setup menu, they actually have that written down where you specify whether it's a hermetic. I thought it was even sealed. in the controls, right? Like, um, you might be right. Oh, General auto sampler. <laughs> We don't have the resolution here to okay. <laughs> show that. But yeah, I mean, but, like, yeah, I, you know, you can even kind of look at what those are if you need. Right. But we know that uh, um, these are all hermetic aluminum pans. Yeah. In these, We're so use forty-eight. In yeah, and case. it even, you know, you don't even enter anything except what reference pan you yeah. wanted to use. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of important when you do certain types of experiments, right? So like, for, for example, when you do heat capacity measurements, you want to very accurately match up the weight of the sample and reference pans as close as you can, right? So you might have a series of uh, reference pans that are all hermetically sealed, but slightly different weights that you can just pick from and match up really well. As well as you can. So, um, and you definitely want to match up the type. Like you said, you exactly. can run, yeah. you know, uh, DSC, you can, we most commonly use hermetically sealed aluminum pans, but there's a huge range of, of in a sense, different containers you can put samples in, open pans, right. graphite, copper, gold. I mean, like they have a bunch of different metals and they all have certain subtly uses, mm -hmm. uh, use cases that are, that make them more ideal. Right. Yeah, the hermetic sealed aluminum and I want to say the crimp style aluminum are, are the two most, two most common. Yeah, yeah they're the, so. I always like hermetic just because I love knowing that things can't get into exactly, and out of right. the system, both from a, a care of the DSC right. standpoint that you don't have to worry about it ever. You know, as long as you've tested, leak tested that hermetic seal and you've, you know, weighed it and and leak tested or let it sit for a while or put it in an oven the maximum temperature it's ever going to and reweighed it, and you know nothing got out of it. Like it makes you feel very safe that there's nothing going to leak into the DSC and yeah, it, absolutely. You know. Yeah, the crimp style typically just give you. Better, better data well, because you better, have better thermal conductivity. Better thermal right. conductivity to the sample, which can yeah. often be really critical. Like with these big hermetic seal volumes and mm -hmm. small samples, they can end up getting in places where your data looks really Sticking weird just because. Yeah. 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 So okay. Yeah. Um, so, so now we've we've said you know this is optional how much data you give it right here, up but, here. Yeah. You know it's just kind of the typical. The more you know uh, inclusive you are in explanation you give, the the that, better yeah. off you are. And then the only other critical uh, item that you need to put here is the actual program for the, the temperature profile that you want to run the experiment over, right? So like you said, you typically have some idea about your sample, what type of, what range you expect transitions in and whatnot, or you know, what range you want to scan over at least, right? So um, we'll put that information here. Um, and you'll see when we, we can also, because these things can be intricate, you can have it do all sorts of isothermal ramp conditions right. up and down and temperature you can do you know you can add tons and tons of, of, of different things so you can make a name where you can save that specific yeah. set of conditions so that you can use it either for another sample or come back and use it again for, for this one etc if you want to yeah. show reproducibility yeah. um, and that's what you know adding a name and stuff does but uh, you can see like I mean the list here is long what you can do right? right like you know all the different things you can change but let's get to what I would say is the most common which is you know DSC is most commonly used in heating mode mm -hmm. and it's because one of the most common transitions to look at we very rarely look at vaporization right or boiling right. Uh, you almost always look at fusion or, or melting and in you know, so it's almost always, you know, going from, you know, a solid to a liquid right. uh, or, or some type of transition around that or solid to solid or liquid to liquid, like, you know, liquid crystal transitions or lipid sure. transitions, et cetera, that you're looking at. And you're almost always, the data in heating mode is almost always more important 
than cooling. in cooling mode. And there's several practical and um, thermodynamic reasons for that we can kind of discuss as we collect this data. But you'd say sure. the most common thing to do is just equilibrate at a temperature that is below the transition you're interested in. Give yourself minimum kind of 10 or 20 degrees yeah. for it to establish a good baseline before that transition is going to happen and then go above it 10 or 20 degrees so that you've established a baseline on either side of a transition you're interested right. in, which will give you heat capacities and just a way to you know, know those baselines really well so that when you're evaluating the transition, you, have, you can extrapolate through it as accurately as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so like I said, we know this transition, it's a calibrant, is at 156. So we're mm -hmm. going to start conservatively 20 or so degrees below. So yeah. we'll equilibrate. And you just click and drag it over, right? You or can just click and drag or, or double, double click it, yeah. um, and it'll so show up here. we'll equilibrate so. at 130. Yeah, that sounds good. And then, uh, and then you typically uh, want to ramp, you know. At a certain yeah. rate. So you would click. say the most common is is 10 or 20, it would, or the two yeah. I'm most. Now, a lot of times slower, in a sense, is better, but there's there's trade-offs here, and these mm -hmm. really get into the nitty-gritty of understanding DSC, because this is a differential technique. Right. The faster you go, in a sense, the more, because it, it's a differential, so you, the more uh, six signal. sensitivity oh, or right. a signal you yeah. would have. Um, but you lose resolution, you right. know, right? Like, because the faster you go, that's it. You're, you're in a sense introducing a kinetic. Yeah. You know, how fast can it melt and stuff? And, you know, while the slower you go, you can often, you know, gain resolution, but lose, yeah. you know, a fair amount of sensitivity. And so there's trade-offs and, and you have to net, just know. But you would say most people just initially setting things up, 10 is a really common, yeah. you know, number to use, right. 10 degrees per minute. Yeah. Um, and then we, it, it, it just asks, so it's going to equilibrate 130 and then it's going to, once it does that, it's going to move down to the next step and it's going to start where it's equilibrated and it's going to ramp at 10 degrees per minute until whatever temperature we tell it to yep. stop. So and we just need to make sure that's above the transition. Right. So we'll do about 180 in this okay. case. Uh, and then once you're done here, you can actually just keep adding things to the list here, right? You can cycle as many well, times as you let's want. Let's actually, uh, you know, do that so. then. Let's then, um, uh, let's leave it at, what I like to do, because a lot of times it doesn't quite, you know, get to 180 or it doesn't, you know, so I don't want to just immediately start a ramp down. Okay. I sometimes like yeah. to just let it sit there, sit for, there yeah. for a little bit before I do a cooling sure. cycle. So let's and we do can a do that with this isotherm. Yeah. So let's isotherm here. for a minute and, and then let's, which I'll it, actually knock that down to half a minute. minute. Yeah. And then let's ramp, yeah. you know, the, op the exact opposite. Right. So, you know, at 10 degrees from 180, which is where it's at down to 130. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we can be, so now we'll have both a heating cycle where it melts and then we'll have um, a cooling well. cycle will watch that liquid crystallize. Yeah. Right. Um, you can get fancier, and and we won't do this, but just to show, you could isolate where it turns data on and off to just those ramp cycles, right. so that it doesn't even collect data during the two parts you don't care about. Yeah. You don't really want the data when it's equilibrating. Yeah. So you can add a step like that. And yeah. Just turn and it and so we could turn it on you know, after the ramp and off yeah, while exactly. it's doing the isothermal. So you can do a whole bunch of fancy things like that. I don't right. think, you know, for this case, we're, yeah, we're we'll, going to do the data analysis later. But it makes the data analysis easier sometimes when you just have the data that you want and you don't have exactly. all the data for these other steps to have to try to navigate through. Yeah, absolutely. So. It actually gives you a lot of control over hardware as well. So you can turn the chiller on and off, um, you know, all sorts of things, gas. So, um, yeah, you have a lot of flexibility here. Yeah. So it reminds me a lot of some things too, which is what you can put one sample in the DSC and do a lot of different experiments, yeah. different ramp, you know, both changing the hardware to see how it affects uh, things, but, but, you know, also changing how you're ramping and how you're holding conditions, mm -hmm. et cetera, or basically, you know, the thermodynamics that you're going through. And then the last thing I'll say is, is this is a modulated DSC. Right. So there's a lot of really fancy things that instead of just linearly ramping, you can do a modulated frequency on that. Right. Which, um, in a sense, you know, what I like to think of is it separates the thermodynamics and kinetics yeah. 
um, of things, which often can get confused. Yeah. Um, so, but it also just gives you a way to more accurately do heat capacity exactly. in, in some thermodynamic measures for uh, reasons we're not going to really discuss today. So let's get this going. Okay. Um, which is, so all you have to do is after you have it is to apply it. Yep. And if you have and a name or something, it'll save that as well, right? Yeah. yeah, you can actually save this profile here. In this case, we won't do that, but right. you just hit the little disk here and save it. To and so it want. even says that we have something in the running queue. Here? Here. Yeah. It says running queue one. Up. <laughs> You see where I'm pointing right here? Right oh, I uh, can't. here. There we go. Let's yeah, see. okay. So you can yeah. even go to you know the design view, but the running queue, this is what we, you know, have, et cetera, right? So we're yeah. at we were at the design where we're doing it. But you can if you want to know what's in the running queue, you can literally yeah. you could have you could queue up multiple, we could set up multiple things yeah. and queue them all up. Actually, this one we put right in the running queue here and we were putting the parameters in, right? right? So this is the one we were working on. Um, but like you said, you can actually queue Create up a bunch a million, of them here yeah. and then eventually move them into the running queue right. for it to run. So, um, so, yeah, so that's, that's in a sense what it. we, what, but you have to do it. Just because you've set it up, you have to get it to the queue yeah. and then tell it to right. you know, run. If it just sits here in the design view, it won't run. Right. But right. that said, if it's already running, Yep. and you add something to the queue, yep. it will just move down the queue yep. and keep running. So the only time stop. you really have to hit this start is the first time when there's nothing in the run queue or it's not started the run queue yet. But as exactly. soon as it does, it keeps going until yep. it gets to the end. Okay. Yeah. So this is the one time we actually have to hit start. Yep. Right? So we'll go up here and hit start. Now, right now it's going through. And in fact, I want to say one of these windows even kind of shows which step it's on. And yeah, um, and so it'll even, it kind of here. says right here uh, that it's in the, you know, pre uh, stage. It's trying to get to, uh, you know, the initial temperature, et cetera. But you can follow it, you know, as it goes, um, you know, through these various things. And in the view, we can watch, you know, which one of the queue it's on. But while it's doing this, it, it collects this. You can go ahead and go back to the, you know, experimental view and set up another experiment. Yeah, we, right? can we could set up as many as yeah, we want. Yeah, we could here. set up as, as many as we want at this point. Yeah. So, um, uh, and it won't really show you the method list, as you were saying. You, it actually shows you a list of what it's going through, right? And um, I wish I could show you that right now because um, you can actually edit those things as it's running as well. So as long as it hasn't run yet. Exactly. Yet. Yeah. So there's a lot of flexibility there. I'm surprised how, um, you know, it, it, that it, you know, it, you can go. You can't really view the. You you can start viewing the data as soon as it starts collecting it, right? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, but it hasn't started collecting yet. Right? Yeah, it's actually right now what it's doing is it's moving the samples in and out. So it'll take a couple of minutes before it actually gets started here. Um, but it should be just about done. And then um, the view here, you have several things controlling over what you can view. But let's, you know, at the same time, like, um, you know, uh, what, when it's doing a lot of this, what most people are doing, because you have that auto sampler, mm -hmm. is just setting up more experiments, more experiments. you know, right. having more things in the queue. Yeah. Now, it's ironic that it's doing this. This is because of what a simple name it was, right? Like the reason it has a dash 13 is because it doesn't want to have to overwrite anything. So yeah. if it sees files with that name already, it just increments another it's smart value about here. it. Yeah, yeah. It won't otherwise you would it would have written yeah. over the original Indian exactly. file. Yeah. And it's because a lot of people do do just that, make very simple names. Yeah. Quick uh, Indium test. We'll just label it Indium, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and we have it, 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 you know, the equilibrate isn't for a specific amount of time. It's just to get to a certain, you know, condition where it considers it equilibrated at that temperature mm -hmm. and ready uh, to yeah, run. Yeah, I, I think we usually use that just because it ramps up to that real quickly in an uncontrolled way, right? You don't really care what rate it's going up to 130 at, but it just gets the DSC to that point, gets it started, and then, you know, then you do a real controlled 10C per minute. Uh, for your real scan, right? Um, so now you're even watching it out of that pre-test condition into right. the run condition, and it even shows you what step it's on. It mm -hmm. is on the equilibrate, so it's trying to get up to 130 degrees 
uh, Celsius. And then it'll move from that, the equilibrate, to the ramp. And that's right. the one where you'll really start to see you know, it dynamically show up on the screen as it goes from ramping 130 to 180. Exactly. Um, it even shows here like a progression, right? Like, um, like the time that it's taken so far. Yeah. Um, actually, it gives you various parameters here um, for the DSC, exactly what's going on. So um, it tells you how much time is actually remaining in that particular segment, how much time has elapsed, um, the method time. So um, yeah, it captures all that information, I want to say, in the file also. Yeah. So when it says that the cell is purging at 50 milliliters per minute, um, you know, that gives you the rate, does, uh, but it doesn't tell you the gas that it's... Yeah, that's actually in the settings there. Uh, we use nitrogen gas for the purge on this DSC, but um, you can also use it's, helium. I was about to say, the other common yeah. one is helium, right? Um, typically, you have to redo calibrations and everything uh, once you switch those gases because thermal conductivities are different. And right. So, and this gives a, a good you know, indication. So this is dynamically scaling the y-axis as it yep. collects data. Um, and you can see it started at 130. Um, it, it's using a normalized heat flow. You can actually change that y-axis to heat capacity or sure. uh, other thermal. But um, you'd say heat flow is the most common. But I, you know, it points out something I like to. You know, you can see the first, you know, two or three degrees here. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it it gets a little bit of a. Di you know, it takes a little bit to before it really stabilizes. Kind of, yeah, yeah, stabilizes and and. You know, I always like to say minimum of kind of five degrees before you really feel good yeah, about its base. I usually go 10. Yeah. So, I mean, whatever you can get away with, the larger the range with your sample. The yeah, and it it's usually for rarely on the cold side. Usually you can always, you know, start a little lower in temperature. Right. Because this one has, um, it has a chiller that takes you down to minus 90, right? That's right. Minus 90 Celsius. Yeah. Um, so it, it's usually oftentimes on the high end that you don't want to go much above a transition. Mm -hmm. And it's rarely because of the DSC. I mean, the DSC will go to, you know, six, seven hundred 700 degrees yeah. very easily. But it's oftentimes there's a lot of transitions that is, you know, as soon as it melts, especially in organic systems, et cetera, that, you know, that it can oxidize or react or, or decompose, decompose or degrade right. in some way. So it's often on the high side that, you know, and it's not because of the limitation of the DSC, but limitations of sample that, yeah. that this gets, um, which is another reason indium and a lot of just the basic elemental metals are mm -hmm. used as calibrants um, right. because, you know, picking the ones that don't oxidize easily and that, you know, you can um, melt very easily and go significantly above the melting without any vapor pressure or degradation or, or stuff like that. And, you know, both the metal in the liquids, it's a metal in both the liquid and solid state, so it has high thermal conductivities. Mm -hmm. and um, so we're uh, getting you know closer to where we would expect. So basically, what you what we have here is this baseline is representing um, you know the difference in heat capacity of the sample over the reference, which the reference has everything else. It's the yeah. same hermetic pan except the sample. Slightly different weight. So some of that is you know attributed to that, but that's why you try to match it up. As, as good as, as possible. possible. Yeah. And then what you're seeing here is that the sample is changing. So it has a differential amount of heat because of either an enthalpic or, you know, either, a, 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 you know, something that is either, you know, exothermic or endothermic. Right. Um, and in fact, you can, you know, change this axis. You would say yeah. that that's not fixed. You can make endothermic either up or down, yeah, just right. depending on, you know, what your most comfortable with, or you would right. say, or what standard you used to. I've seen both, yeah. actually. That's right. Um, so, uh, and then, so we basically just watched indium go from a solid, you know, to a liquid. Mm -hmm. And then we're letting, we're collecting enough data in the liquid state so that we get kind of the same as in the solid state where we have, you know, a baseline that we could um, yeah. look at. So I think while it's collecting this, and we're going to see this collect all the way up uh, 2080, I think it's worth pointing out a couple things. One is this data, um, and, and I don't think we showed this explicitly, but um, uh, in the setup, in fact, let's go to the setup real quick, just to show that this can keep it's collecting data while we yeah. do it. And we can look at, um, so the one thing we didn't do is we 
gave it a file name, but we could have given it the where it's being saved. Yeah, as data, right. And we didn't. Yeah. So, um, so it has a default location. And, and the good thing is you can see here and look at it. It's user, right. Yarger Lab, Dropbox, blah, blah, you know, uh, yeah. a very specific location. But you'll see just that. It's a Dropbox location. So this is pretty common. We have things upload directly to a cloud right. so that even when you're collecting this remotely, it's not saved locally. It's saved uh, somewhere where you can access it at any time. Mm -hmm. And what you're accessing is an uh, .tri, which is just the extension that Trios uses, but it's a binary file that is a proprietary binary format, you know, which is very common in instruments right. so that it's small, safe space, et cetera. Yeah. And of course, this Trios software opens it, which is freely accessible to you. However, it's very common in data that you want to be able to have it in a more general format that could be opened by more or less any general software right. for data analysis. And that's what I would just generally say is a text or ASCII mm -hmm. type format. And this you can do that, right? You can just save as, yeah. and you can save it as I want to say Excel, which is yeah. CVS. Um, as a spreadsheet format. Which is what, yeah. comma, it's yeah. a comma delimited file Yeah, format. comma separated in values file. or yeah, CSV. Uh, and uh, or you can save it as just a text file, which I want to say is either tab or space delimited, right. you know, uh, column, etc. So, um, so you know, it saves it by default, um, and you can change the location stuff. But it's going to save that in that binary. I always recommend when the data is finished that we save it in an ASCII or a text type or right. uh, format as well. Now, what it's doing is it's already stayed at, it's already finished its ramp. Right. And so now we could analyze this, and we're going to cover this in another video. The onset gives mm -hmm. you the melting temperature, where it right. starts to melt. Right here. And if we went slower, it would yeah. just, you know, it would still onset the same. It would just, you know, have a peak that's a little closer to the onset and a, right. an overall integration that's smaller because the differential as you go over a smaller rate Right. Um, so, and then it held at 180 for half a minute, and now we're watching the red curve is cooling. So now we're watching that liquid as we're cooling it. So this was this peak. The area under it represents the delta H of fusion or the heat of fusion, um, uh, or what you know, a, a fancy way of saying the heat of melting. You know. Right. Um, now what we're going to watch is you know it the crystallization. Right, the opposite, what should be equal and opposite. Uh, but even in this sample, I would even predict, we'll see something that is very common. And it gets to the heart of why we almost always measure something melting and we rarely watch the opposite. So your first, the, the kind of paradox or the, the question here is, what does it matter? If you look at a thermodynamic textbook or your freshman chemistry or physics textbook, you'll see that you know when you melt something, um, you know the opposite of it, you know, is crystallizing it, and one is the positive delta H of fusion, and one is just the negative of it. It's just equal and opposite, right? right? So why does it matter which one of these two you measure? And it has to do with a very practical thing, which is solids, you know, inherently have nucleation to the liquid state. They're, they always, a solid, a finite solid has a surface yeah. that defines the end of it, and that surface is the inherent place where it will nucleate that liquid, or it will start, you know, to change that. While, right. um, you know, solids, uh, you know, now you have a liquid, and anywhere in that liquid, it could nucleate that crystal, right. right? And often, as we've seen here, and I would have predicted that you will see it always undercool a little bit, right? And and so you always watch, you know, a solid start to melt at the you know at the same temperature, mm -hmm. but you can watch, um, you know, a liquid crystallize, Crystal. and it can it can super cool or sub cool, you know, different amounts just depending on the size of the sample, yeah. the container it's in, how fast you're going, and, and yeah. stuff like that. And so there's a real reason why it's the heating curve that we look at more consistently. The other thing you'll see is that it, you know, it. It basically went down and then it overlaps. Yeah, itself. it overlaps. Right. And that's because of you know the transition that it starts, you know, 
releasing off heat, right. you know, yeah. out of this system. And so you see that. And so, you know, it doesn't form a peak in nearly the same way. Exactly. Um, and if we would have gone at a faster rate, you would see this undercool even more. If we yeah. made the sample smaller, it would have undercooled further and you would have saw more of this type of, right. of thing, et cetera, because there's a bigger CPDT over that, et cetera. Now you can, uh, you know, so this, you know, exactly highlights, you yeah. know, uh, the reason why. So I think, you know, even without getting to the end here, um, you know, can, you know, right now we can, can we save that data? Oh, I don't know if we can while it's running, but I can show you how. Uh, we can just click on the experiment here and uh, right click it and you just hit save as, as, and it gives you other options. But then you can go to export, yeah. Right, so, and this is what you were talking about earlier, just exporting it to either a spreadsheet format, which would be Excel, uh, to plain ASCII or text, which would be here. Um, and once you hit that, it gives you options for what type of delimiter to use and what kind of format you want. There's various options in there. Okay. That. So that's really, and then that's the last thing I was saying, is it inherently saves the trios file. I would advise yeah. saving it as either an Excel or a plain text right. or both, you yeah. know, so that you really could then put it into obviously Excel or any, you know, a package. I often even save the parameters as a separate file just because it really does save the complete parameter list exactly. of the calibration and all the DSC. Right. So I think that introduces, you know, really starting from scratch and collecting data. This was just mm -hmm. collecting a basic indium sample. In future videos, we'll show uh, maybe some collection, some, some being able to seal these samples, what it is sure. to seal these, uh, some advanced data collection, uh, calibration, and probably most importantly at this point is follow up with a video on now that we have this data, how to analyze it in both TRIOS as well as the, analyze the ASCII data in something like Excel. Right. Thank you. Thanks.